Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, my guest today is registered dietitian, or should I say plant-based registered dietitian, Sharon Palmer, who's written a fabulous new book called The Plant-Powered Plan to Beat Diabetes. She's going to be making a recipe from the book, a banana quinoa pudding. Please welcome her back to the show. It's so nice to see you again. Hi, it's so great to be back again. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, congratulations on the new book. Tell us about it. Yes. Well, this is my brand new book. It's about uh, how the uh, plant-based diet is good for not only preventing diabetes, for managing it if you have diabetes. Uh, There's a lot of exciting research that shows that a plant-based diet could even get you off your meds. So this is really exciting. And so this book really talks about how you can eat that plant-based diet that's specially uh, adapted towards diabetes. And then it includes a hundred vegan recipes. Wow. And you made all the recipes yourself, right? Yes. I make all my recipes in my kitchen here in Ojai, California. I test and develop all my recipes. And these were uh, specifically focused on diabetes friendly recipes, although really plant-based eating in general is diabetes friendly eating. So it's kind of an overall lifestyle that's good for diabetes. Well, uh, look at these, look at the pictures. Oh my God. You mean I can have this if I'm diabetic? Yes, absolutely. Whole grains, pulses, fruits, vegetables. Research is showing that all those foods can not only help, you know, prevent diabetes from happening. In fact, a study found that vegans have a 77% lower chance of even getting diabetes, which is shocking, you know? Um, and then now the newer research is showing that all these foods can help control your diabetes and help prevent these complications that can happen. Wow. Look at that. At least this looks delicious, by the way. Did you take the pictures? Did you do the photo? Uh, we had an outside photographer for this project, but I do take my own photos from my blog at SharonPalmer.com. And I have taken photos for some of my books, but I love the photographer in this book too. Amazing. Oh my God. Look at that. Yes. Those are the orange uh, whole grain cinnamon rolls. So do I, does somebody, does somebody have, Ooh, look at, this is perfect for this time of year. Oh yeah. Fruit and veggie ice pop. Does somebody with diabetes have to eat differently than somebody without diabetes if they're vegan? Well, the thing that I like to focus on is a little more balance. So a plant-based diet is really good for managing diabetes if you have it, but you also want to make sure your meals are really balanced, that you're planning your plate where you're getting, you know, uh, a fourth of your plate with whole grains, a half of your plate with vegetables, and a fourth of your plate with a plant protein. And a lot of times we're eating that way, but it's just a little bit more focused on that portion control managing, especially if you're on insulin. Absolutely. And so you've seen people actually get off their insulin. Yes. There's studies that show that within 25 days, people who are eating a a diet that I just described with exercise were able to get off uh, their medications, whether it's insulin or uh, um, oral medication. However, this is a very individual thing. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people saying that they're reducing their medications, but it is possible to make huge uh, improvements in your diabetes with a plant-based diet because it, you know, it has all these phytochemicals. The scientists are really thinking it's the the phytochemicals and then the fiber, the two really important things that could be helping with diabetes management. Does it matter how long a person's been on medication like insulin to to determine whether they can get off it or not if they follow a plant-based diet? Uh, Well, you know, it's very individual. What I like to recommend is that you read the book and then discuss this with your healthcare provider, because every single person with diabetes has a different set of circumstances, a different, you know, we react differently to foods. We have different glucose control patterns. So using this diet, working with your healthcare practitioner, and then watching what happens with your A1C, can you start reducing your medications and just work that way uh, along with your healthcare provider and um, on an individual basis? That makes sense. Yeah. So I'm gonna get I want to get this started. Oh, yeah, please. I'm so sorry. Yeah, get, get your recipe uh, and then we'll chat. And then we can talk. This is this is the banana quinoa pudding, and it just is an example of how you can make a healthy dessert with no added sugar because we still recommend no added sugars um, for you know diabetes management, of course. 
you know, that makes the, the glucose management a little more soft and gentle. We don't get those high raises in blood glucose. So I just wanted to make this one easy recipe. It's a key, it's like a banana rice pudding, but this is quinoa. So I'm going to start with adding one and a half cups of water to this pot and then my quinoa. This is one cup of uncooked quinoa. I'm using the beige and uh, you could use the rainbow. You could use the uh, red quinoa. I kind of like the beige for this recipe. And then we're also going to use one cup of coconut milk beverage. Um, so I've got two cups here. I'm going to use half of that here. And then I want to get this cooking. So I wanted to tell you this coconut milk beverage is not the canned coconut milk because even the light coconut milk uh, has this, a pretty decent share of saturated fat. I mean, I do use it a little bit in my cooking, but I try to keep it to a minimum. The coconut milk beverage that you see in the refrigerated section is much lower in saturated fat. And this is unsweetened coconut milk beverage. So if you want that coconut flavor without the saturated fat. Um, so I'm gonna let this cook a little bit. And if you wanna talk more, um, AJ, about the, about the book, we can while this is cooking a little bit. I would love to. So what does the research show now about diabetes? Like what, what has it changed over the years? Because this is something you learned in dietitian school, you know, that you can yeah. actually reverse diabetes with a plant-based diet. That's a great question. You know, I've been a dietitian for a long time and we, it used to be very old fashioned in the diabetes world where we didn't even really think that the quality of carbohydrates mattered. We just count total carbohydrates and balance it with your insulin and and there was not a focus on healthy eating, even though we knew that people who have diabetes have more risks of heart disease, eye disease, kidney disease, Alzheimer's, cancer, all of these things. When your glucose is starting to get high, you are at risk for all of that. So uh, the research, I would say in the last 10 years, started really showing that it's the quality of your diet. It's not just total carbohydrates. And then these studies started coming through showing that if you ate a vegan diet, if you have diabetes, you could have significant improvements. So the interesting thing is that I was asked by the American Diabetes Association to write this book uh, right before COVID because they, you know, American Diabetes Association recognized that plant-based diets were good for diabetes. However, during COVID, their publishing arm kind of uh, dissolved a little bit. So I, that book contract came back to me. And so I, I used a different publisher, but just to illustrate how an American Diabetes Association is interested in this. And now they have officially come out with a statement that plant-based diets are good for uh, diabetes management. All of the major organizations are saying this. So this is not just a little um, you know, idea out there. This is becoming a mainstream recognized idea that eating a plant-based diet could be an option for people who want to manage their diabetes. It could help them reduce their medications, number one, keep their glucose under control, number two, and reduce all those complications um, because people with diabetes have a much higher risk of things like heart disease, hypertension, and all those things. That's really cool. How did the ADA know to contact you? So I'm, a, I'm kind of known in the dietitian world for the plant-based Face. Um, I know you know lots of the dietitians in the plant-based world, but there's not enough of us, right? So, so you know, there there is, uh, you know, kind of some some knowledge around my work in uh, the plant-based nutrition world. So they had recognized that I was um, would be a candidate for writing that book. So I was really happy to do that. It was really a fun project, and sadly during COVID, it just kind of dissolved. But I was able to just work with another publisher, so that was exciting. How many books have you written so far, Sharon? This is my fourth book. So my first two are about plant-based nutrition. The first one is really the about plant-based nutrition. It's the plant power diet. So if you want to know all the nutrition part, the second one is more of a cookbook, plant powered for life. And then the third was called California Vegan, which is kind of like my love for California cuisine. And you're from California too. So, you know, we have that special vibe when it comes to plant-based cooking. I feel we have this history here and, uh, all the different cultural elements of a plant-based diet. And then this is my fourth. Nice. You know, you mentioned before we logged on that your parents were kind of living in a blue zone. Yes, I was raised in a blue zone. I was raised in, uh, I went to school at Loma Linda where, where it was the original blue zone in the U.S. And I was raised in a Seventh-day Adventist family and uh, they are really the blue zone um, 
uh, culture where it's not only the plant-based diet. We were raised eating a plant-based diet and very healthy. We had our own food and my mom canned and, uh, you know, we've made our own bread and we ate some of the first plant-based foods that were available in the U S and it was just a part of our life. And then, uh, also the other part of the blue zone, the physical activity, not going to the gym, but like gardening, hiking, walking, um, the, the spiritual connections, the social community, my parents had all of that and they lived very long, healthy lives. Did you know any of the other, uh, prominent vegans uh, or plant-based blue zone people like Dr. Hans Deal, who lives in Loma Linda? I knew Dr. Wareham, uh, Ellsworth Wareham. I don't know. You know you... Oh my God. I didn't yeah. have my YouTube show, but when I had an actual TV show, he's amazing. You knew. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. I was friends with their family for years and he, I think he lived 104, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was more like 105 and 106. He was, yeah. in, and I think he was doing heart surgery till he was like 97 when his wife said, Hey, you know, s- spend some time with us already. You know, I know he was amazing. He, he had such a healthy lifestyle and I, you know, he really lived, lived that for his whole life, you know? So it's that, you know, it's that years and years of living that lifestyle that can make such a big impact. Like my parents, you know, they had, they were completely independent until their late eighties. You know, they were, they lived that high quality. It's not just how long you live. It's the quality of your life. Right. And to have, you know, to be sharp and to be doing what you want, gardening and, you know, traveling. I mean, that's a huge thing that we all want to strive for. Absolutely. Do you know Dr. John Scharfenberg, who's been on my show? He's almost 100, Seventh-day Adventist, raised vegetarian, now vegan. And it, wow, it, I don't know him. Oh, you got to meet him. He's, he's, he's we're, we're actually friends now because he lives near me and we hang out. And he's just one of the most inspiring people and basically speaking. Yeah speak and all speak in the same language. So I noticed you use quinoa in this recipe. Is that maybe, is quinoa better for diabetics than rice, for example? Well, you know, I still recommend brown rice for, it would be a good whole grain. I do recommend only whole grains in my book and, and um, in general. And then it, as possible, if you have them in their intact form, I'm just kind of checking on my quinoa and stirring it here. So if you have, um, if you, you want to have your whole grains as much as possible in their intact form, like that quinoa, you could see the kernels. Um, it wasn't ground. You're going to get a much lower glycemic response when you eat that in, in, in the intact form. You could use brown rice here. Quinoa is a little bit better. It has a, you know, it has more fiber, more protein. So I do like to use quinoa, but you can have brown rice. You can have sorghum. You can have oats, uh, amaranth, millet, all those beautiful whole grains can fit into your vegan diabetes friendly diet. Absolutely. So you were basically raised vegan, or at least I'm guessing vegetarian, right? I was raised semi vegetarian, because in the uh, Seventh-day Adventist community, the whole goal is to be vegetarian. And if you were really good, you would be vegan. And my parents were always aiming for that. And, but you know, it was not 100%. But then I went to school at Loma Linda, which is 100% plant based, as you know, and um, that was my whole nutrition education was uh, focused on plant-based. And then within my own practice, I started doing um, vegan, uh, you know, exclusively, uh, I would say like 13 years ago, perhaps. But I do, I do write a lot about plant-based nutrition and, if, you know, I've written about vegetarian diets. I've written about other types of plant-based diets to help people along their journey. But in my own um my own personal lifestyle. I eat a vegan diet. All my recipes are hundred percent plant-based. Nice. That's fantastic. Hey, you know, there's different types of diabetes. I've heard of type one, type two, even type one and a half. And some people even call Alzheimer's type three. So do you recommend different strategies or different versions of a plant-based or vegan diet, depending on what type of diabetes a person has, or maybe even pre-diabetes? Great question. So Really, the, the kind of lifestyle of eating a plant-based diet is good for everything. All of those kinds of diabetes. In fact, that's why I say this diet, this book isn't just for people with diabetes or, or uh, who have pre-diabetes. It's really for all of us because so many of us are at risk for, pre, uh, for type 1, uh, type 2 diabetes, rather. Uh, there are so many risk factors. I, even being over the age of 40 is a risk factor of uh, type 2 diabetes. So most of us really like all of us should be eating this way. 
however, um, if you are on insulin, then it's the same diet, but you just want to manage it a little bit more closely because you really need to manage that insulin versus your diet. And that's where I talk about working with your diabetes educator, your dietitian to set up a meal plan that's exactly balanced for your, uh, your medication management plan. But it's the same foods. It's the same, it's the same foods. It's the same way of eating. It, it's just, if you're on insulin, you might want to manage that a little more tightly. You know, I see so many people in the plant-based space that aren't diabetes. It's like, it's become a thing like an Apple watch where they're wearing these continuous glucose monitors. Do you think that's something that we all should do? Because to me, to me, it sounds almost obsessive, like people that weigh themselves every day. I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, we're talking about people that don't have diabetes, right? Is that right. Yeah, no, they do it because it's like cool and it's a thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, really? Yeah. Like, Because isn't, I mean, for people, isn't the point of eating, your blood sugar is supposed to go up when you eat it. <laughs> It would be abnormal if it didn't. So I don't understand how that's giving anybody that is not diabetic useful information. I agree hundred percent. And that is a fad. Uh, I, I see it on Instagram and it just, it, I just want to like call them out because that's a complete fad. It, it makes us everybody too anxious. There's too much stress about our eating. And even when we're eating a plant-based diet, we should, I mean, these foods are beautiful and delicious and we don't have to worry and, and micromanage and uh it's it, then food doesn't even become a pleasure you know so there is no benefit and you're absolutely right that's a normal body response when you eat your blood glucose rises now when you're eating a more whole plant-based diet it's not going to rise so dramatically but if that's the normal reaction is your blood glucose rises your insulin ushers that glucose into your cells for energy um and then that, that's normal management I'm going to start working on this next step while we, uh, just a second. Now the quinoa has been cooking and I'm going to actually uh, add kind of a little sauce. It's going to thicken this up a little. I'm going to add that rest of that coconut milk beverage. Again, that's not the canned coconut. It's just the coconut milk beverage, some cornstarch, a tablespoon of cornstarch. And then I've got a teaspoon of cinnamon and half a teaspoon of cardamom, just for a little bit of cinnamon, uh, sweet spice taste. And by the way, cinnamon is good for um, eating uh, for diabetes. It can ha uh, help manage your glucose a little better. I'm going to save the, the coconut for the end. And then I've got a little vanilla. So I'm just going to kind of whip this up and add this to the coconut, uh, to the quinoa banana pudding. So that's going to thicken it up while it's cooking. We're going to add this here and it, it's starting to get nice and bubbly here. I mean, you just want to cook it about 15 minutes. I'm going to take the lid off to let it kind of reduce. And then I'm going to mash um, some bananas here. Oops. I'm going to mash the bananas. Is there a per, a per um, do you like your bananas, you know, more ripe or more unripe? And if somebody is diabetic, is it more important? Maybe they'd be less ripe or, you know? Yeah, they, you know, that's a very good question. And the riper the fruit is in general, they do tend to have more natural sugar. So they will uh, increase the glycemic response of that food. However, I don't really get too, you know, focused on those little things. I'd rather just focus on you know, uh, eating the banana and not having the sh added sugars, but that is a good point. So oh, this recipe, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, I love bananas, but the thing, it drives me crazy because it's almost like you have to buy them every day because I enjoy yeah. them just at a certain point. You know, I don't want them green, but I don't like them too sweet. And it's like, it's like, you got like this one day to eat them. I know I'm the same way. I, especially when it gets warmer right now, I don't like them too, but if they do get too ripe, then that's when I make uh, banana bread. I have a really exactly good or freeze them for smoothies or ice cream. Yeah. So yeah, I don't so waste don't them. waste them if they do get too ripe. But you're right. I like them a little on the greener side. These ones are just perfect. You could have them. This recipe could handle really, really ripe bananas. Um, but I'm just going to mash these because when the, um, the the quinoa pudding is done cooking, you're just going to fold those mashed uh, bananas in there. I almost said potatoes. <laughs> and then that's gonna be the natural sweetening. So there's no added sugars, there's no sugar substitute from this 
recipe is just the bananas, which you can really use as natural sweetener and all sorts of things. I know you use a lot of mashed bananas. Right? I do. I'm writing a dessert cookbook right now. And in, in like, if I don't want to always have to use dates, which are healthy, but much higher in caloric density, bananas are great for sweetening. Yeah. And they have that nice creaminess. They can also kind of add the fat replacement too, right? Yeah. Moisture too. There you can yeah. For oil free, oil free. Speaking of which, there is a question in the chat from a live viewer who has your book. Her name is uh-huh. Linda. And where did that go? Oh, yeah. I have Sharon's book, and some of her recipes include oil. Does she think that whole food, plant based diets with oil are desirable for diabetics? So, my philosophy on oil is that um, usually I let that be more of an optional item. I use a very small amount in some of my recipes. But I always let people know that you can omit it. You don't have to use it. I I think that you can have a small amount. Um, of course, the whole plant fats are a really good alternative. Uh, for example, using mashed avocado and um, nuts and nut butter um, is even, I think, a better alternative. But I do use a very small amount with a, a caveat that you could uh, omit it if you if you want to completely do oil free. Nice. This recipe is oil free. So I'm going to let this cook just a little bit longer before I add the mashed um, the mashed bananas. But if you have any other questions, I can yeah, answer. I, so for, for diabetes specifically, are there key elements of a plant-based diet that seem even better for people that are trying to manage their diabetes or maybe even reverse it? That's a great question. So what the research is really showing, it's... Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's the phytochemicals because plant foods are very high in phytochemicals that act as antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds. So it turns out that these are very good for diabetes. They can make our insulin more sensitive so that our body is actually using our insulin in a better way. They can also help prevent all those complications that happen, such as heart disease. That's really the number one complication we worry about if you have diabetes because you're so prone to heart disease. So um, those are, that's one huge part of the puzzle, why plant-based diets are so good, because we're eating all these whole grains, fruits, vegetables, um, nuts, seeds, plant proteins, like uh, pulses. So these are rich in antioxidant compounds. In fact, uh, plant foods are the only place you can find phytochemicals. So if you're eating a 100% plant-based diet that's very much based on whole foods, you're going to be, your body is bathed in these phytochemicals. Uh, the other aspect is fiber. You really need to have that fiber. In fact, uh, some work on this diabetes uh, management found that 40 grams of fiber per day is what we need to be aiming for, for diabetes. And I will just tell you that I've done my um, fiber analysis and sometimes I'm getting 70 grams a day. So it's 40 grams is nothing if you're eating a whole foods plant-based diet. Um, so if, I mean, the average American is only eating 15 grams of fiber. So this is more than double. So fiber really slows down the digestion uh, of those, uh, the absorption and digestion of those carbohydrates. So it really slows down that glucose response to your food that you're eating. So having that high fiber diet, lots of pulses. Uh, Pulses are the fiber kings, things like beans and lentils, whole grains, all of those are really important. And then, um, you know, fruits and vegetables also have fiber. It's the different types of fiber we want to try to get in our diets too. Um, so that that is really important. Uh, another thing that we're finding is the gut microbiome has an impact on diabetes. So the research is showing that if you have a very uh, healthful gut microbiome profile, it can help reduce your risk of, of obesity and diabetes. So it seems like the gut may have a big area too. And research is showing that a vegan diet People who eat have, vegans have very positive gut microbiome uh, profiles. In fact, you know, they're doing fecal transplants with vegans because they have such a beautiful gut microbiome. So there's all these elements that are underneath that diet that seems to be really where those benefits are coming from. And then the one other thing is obesity. Uh, plant-based diets are linked with lower body weight, no counting calories or anything, which is just people weigh less, sometimes up to one entire BMI category. So just eating that plant-based diet can help uh, with weight, which is another way, just weight alone can reduce your risk of of diabetes um, and help you manage it. So it's all of those things. Yeah. 
Yep, that's true. It goes. Uh, so uh, one of the live viewers named, and there's no name, but uh, asks, I have a granddaughter who is an adult with diabetes. She feels she can eat what she wants, even if it's harmful to her. She believes when she does this, she can just take more insulin. Any suggestion on what I could say to her that may help her make better choices? She's already had a toe amputated. Wow. That's something. You know, it, it, it's not just with, um, I don't see this just with people that are diabetic, but like ever since, you know, Dr. Furman has said, like, if we hadn't invented these medications like statins and stuff, people then would have to take responsibility for their health and make changes. But I see people even with GERD, it's like they, because they can take something, they'll just eat what they want and take more medicine. I see that too. It's such a great comment. And I see that all the time. When I, when I was working with patients years ago in the hospital with, with diabetes, there was really this idea, like, you know, let's keep, that was before we had so much automation and insulin delivery. There was really like very focused on, we got to keep that insulin. Like we don't want it, the insulin to keep going up. Like let's manage it. But now with the insulin delivery systems, there's like this kind of concept. Well, well I can defeat whatever I want. I just, I just get more insulin you now, but it's, that is never good because your body's not utilizing that insulin as well as it could be. And the huge aspect is complications. You know, we, it's, the, the, the uh, significance of diet is so powerful. Even the Academy, uh, the um, American Diabetes Association has said that self-management of your diabetes is the number one thing. It's what you're doing every day. Your diet, walking, just physical activity in, increases your insulin sensitivity, reduces your need for medication. So it's like what you're doing every day is the most powerful thing. It's not going to the doctor. And of course that's important but it's your daily management of your disease, your diet, you know, uh, doing everything you can to keep the medications from being increased, you know, uh, keeping your insulin as sensitive as possible, eating healthily, and also keeping your heart healthy, you know, keeping your brain healthy, all those things. It's so important. I'm going to stir in my um, bananas, my mashed bananas into the quinoa as we're talking. Okay, that is cooked now nice and thick. I think you can see that it's nice and thick. Smells so good, the bananas. Oh my goodness. It's just a very comforting um, dessert. And I like to just dish it up. I'm going to show you in a little dessert cup, but this is healthy enough. You could really eat it for breakfast. I mean, this is basically like a, a it could be a porridge bowl in my mind because there's no added sugar. It's got whole grains and I've got some fruit in here. So I'm going to actually dish one up here. I've got my little Sunday dish and I'm, I think I just basically dish it up and then I garnish it with some sliced bananas. And then I've got some coconut here. So I just garnish it with some sliced bananas. And then this is unsweetened um, coconut shreds that are the, the bigger uh, flake type um, size. I think it's pretty, you could use shredded coconut too. And then I would use a little mint leaf for my garden to add a little green there. But that's what it looks like. So you could dish these up or you can serve it in one bowl, like family style too. Like a trifle almost. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that was easy to make and that looks delicious. Almost like a pudding, could be dessert. Yeah, it's like a pudding. Think about it like your grandma's banana pudding, banana rice pudding. My mom used to always make a banana rice pudding. That was one of our favorite uh, family easy desserts. So this is just a little twist on that with the quinoa and then with those bananas, no added sugar. Yeah, Sonia's saying, so you could eat this for breakfast? I would, I would actually chill this because it's, it's basically a whole grain and fruit. So in fact, I think I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna make up some of these. I would add some nuts for a little more protein, maybe some walnuts or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. So other than whole grains, which you mentioned, are there other key foods that are part of a diabetes fighting diet? So one thing is the, um, the vegetables. I just can't say enough about vegetables because they are lower carbohydrates. So, you know, it, we, I still recommend that you monitor your carbohydrates in terms of that plate method and that you're balancing out your plate. It's important to make sure you're getting enough protein. So when you think of your plate, a fourth of it with your plant protein, that could be like tofu, beans, lentils. Uh, or a meat alternative or something. And then a fourth of it with your whole grain and then a half of it with uh, vegetables. So things like green beans, tomatoes, eggplant, zucchini, 
um, salad, kale, I mean, you name it. That half is really what's important because it's very low in carbohydrate and it's packed with those antioxidants. So really that making sure you're getting the, getting that vegetable, uh, half of that plate with vegetables is really important. And another thing I wanna really recommend is biodiversity with the vegetables in particular. So when we think about not just having the same vegetables every day, not just the carrots and the green beans, but try some different types of vegetables. Go to the farmer's market. Like, have, have you ever tried uh, rutabaga or kohlrabi or purple Brussels sprouts or just all the different colors, varieties, types of vegetables? Try to increase the diversity of your vegetables because they're going to get different phytochemicals, more phytochemicals. I do recommend a green leafy vegetable every day, uh, especially if you can do a cru cruciferous because then that's going to have the, those compounds in the cruciferous vegetables that are very protective. Um, so that's one thing. And then, you know, making sure you're also getting some of those really important, like the lycopene, lycopene rich tomatoes a few times a week, uh, getting that diversity, the vitamin A rich with your yellow and orange vegetables a few times a week. So really trying to focus on that variety. That's great. Guys, if you have questions, please type them in the chat with for, uh, four question marks first. Um, so here's one from Jennifer. Is it true that true cinnamon is good for balancing blood sugar? I, what's true cinnamon? T-R-U-E cinnamon? Hmm. Yeah, there's actually some research that shows that cinnamon has helped uh, keep your blue blood glucose levels a little bit uh, high, uh, lower. So it's not a magic cure. I mean, but there have been some studies about cinnamon and, and blood glucose. So again, I just say, put it in your diet, use it more often, sprinkle it in your coffee. If you drink coffee, sprinkle it over your oatmeal in the morning and see if it, if it helps you see if you see an improvement. What I really love to encourage is if you are uh, um, uh, dealing with diabetes, whether it's type one, type two, prediabetes, gestational, try your whole foods, plant-based diet, try that plate that I was describing and see what happens to your A1C numbers, see what happens to your blood pressure, your cholesterol, all of those things and monitor it and see it, see if some of these things work for you. Cause we're all very individual. Great. Thank you. What do you have any opinion on the different types of cinnamon? I know Dr. Greger has talked about cassia versus I, I don't know the other brands. I just go by the one that tastes better to me, which is the cassia because it's very sweet. I haven't really, um, I don't really know a lot about the different cinnamons in terms of antioxidant capacity. I, I usually go whatever I can find in my supermarket, but um, whatever, I, I, I know I've tried the, um, uh, is it the Vietnamese cinnamon that's really good? But I'm not, I'm not a cinnamon expert, so I've just tried different type, types, but I do love my cinnamon. I know, cinnamon's fantastic. And cinnamon and vanilla, they go so well together. Let's see, um, looking for questions in the chat. In the meantime, I will ask one. So how, do you recommend like what a day's worth of eating could look like for somebody that's either fighting diabetes, trying to reverse it, or maybe even just prevent it? And if you want, you could even maybe suggest some recipes from this book. If you just joined us, we're here with plant-based, the plant-powered dietitian, Sharon Palmer, who wrote a wonderful new book called The Plant-Powered Plan to Beat Diabetes. She made a delicious quinoa banana pudding from it, which you can catch up if you just joined us? Yeah, actually in the book, I have a sample meal plan for a whole week. And so if you're kind of wanting to see how you would lay out a diet and that sample meal plan could be appropriate for pre-diabetes, type one diabetes, type two, insulin control, oral medication. So there is an entire week of sample meal plans that you could kind of go by and it would show you how to plan those meals. So I do recommend checking that out. Um, it's really, again, I love using that plate method if you've just joined, where you're really planning your meals to balance out. Because if you are on insulin, it's important to make sure you are like getting enough protein. You know, sometimes we have meals where we're just like on the fly, where, you know, we're grabbing something. Maybe I have this for breakfast tomorrow, but I did need that protein in there. So I need to make sure I'm getting a little more protein when I'm on that insulin control plan. And then uh, again, at lunch and dinner and uh, snacks can be helpful too particularly at night, a well-planned snack, because you're going to be going all the way through to breakfast the next day. 
So it's when you're um, not on insulin, it's a little bit uh, easier to, to consider balancing out, you know, that, that meal. It's not quite so as important. Right. So you want to not go on insulin if at all possible. Yes, exactly. You want to control your, your, uh, your diabetes. Uh, you can put it into remission. There's research that's showing people are putting it to remission. Doesn't work for everybody. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really dependent on our own conditions and our own uh, bodies. So it has worked for many people though. You went to Loma Linda for dietitian school, if that's what you call it, right? Or for your dietitian education? I did Loma Linda, the, one of the blue zones. And so did they at the time talk about a diabetes reversal or other disease reversals and do traditional di- diabetes, you know, dietetic school talk about that? Or do they just talk about treatment? Well, I went to school way, way back. And the whole focus, sadly, in the nutrition world was disease management. There was very little about prevention. I mean, it was just starting to come out. But, uh, you know, the Blue Zones philosophy was the philosophy that I was raised with was that your body is a temple. You take care of your temple and, and diet was a huge part of taking care of your body. But we didn't really have the research on prevention that we have now. Uh, it was about 30 years ago that those first studies were coming out showing that people who ate uh, vegetarian and vegan diets, you know, live longer, have lower risks of things. And for one, at one point in time, when I went to school, we had to fight to even say those diets were nutritionally adequate because people thought they were risky. So the, I would say in the last three decades of research has changed dramatically and now showing that it's not just risky, it's actually healthy. There's a reduced risk of so many different diseases So it's really come full circle and I'm seeing more and more physicians. I don't know if you're experiencing this, um, but so, you know, physicians all over the United States, you know, telling their patients, I want you to try a plant-based diet. Can you find a plant-based dietitian? And, you know, it's just so encouraging that physicians are, are, you know, learning more about this, that dietitians are more versed. Although I do recommend if you are going to see a dietitian about your diabetes plan, um, to make sure you're seeing a dietitian who is knowledgeable of plant, about plant-based nutrition, because it is kind of a subspecialty. Did you ever work with people like in a clinical setting on this? Uh, on diabetes? Yeah. Um, or just, uh, did, like, did you ever work at a hospital or anything like that? I did for years and years. I worked in hospitals and diabetes consults were just re- everyday things where we'd get a call from the doctor newly diagnosed patient with type two diabetes, please talk to them about their diet before they go home. And we'd have like an hour to talk to them. And, um, you know, now we know so much more than those days, uh, where, you know, we would talk about the diabetes plan and it wasn't so much about the quality of the diet. It was more about the total carbohydrates. And now we know so much more. So that's exciting. Nice. Yeah. Let me go back to the chat and see if there's any questions. Yeah. Do you think they're teaching it differently at Loma Linda now? Because I think they even have like some kind of program, like a master's degree or something I, I saw in plant-based nutrition there. They do. They do. And they, you know, the Adventist health studies too. I don't know if you've heard of those. They were the, really the landmark studies that happened at Loma Linda University that documented the benefits of plant-based diets. I mean, we can thank Loma Linda to actually putting it on the map to showing you know, they looked at all these different health issues and they found that the vegans compared to all the different diet patterns had the lowest risk of all these things. So, you, you know, they really are, uh, you know, ground setters for, for documenting the prevention benefits and now the, you know, disease management benefits. They're just constantly expanding their knowledge base on, on the health benefits. And they have an amazing um, vegetarian Congress every five years and international. If anybody gets a chance to go, it's at Loma Linda. I don't, I think the next one might be next year. I don't know if you've been there, um, AJ, but it's amazing. Sounds great. Do you go to this and are there, I know that like, I'm sure there's a, like an organization for all registered dietitians in general. Do you have one specifically for plant-based dietitians? Yeah. The, so as far as the first question, um, uh, about that vegetarian summit, it's called vegetarian summit, but it encompasses vegan diets as well. And it's international. All the researchers around the world who are studying, uh, vegan diets come and they present their research. It's, am- it's 
amazing. And you get to go to Loma Linda, see the Loma Linda Blue Zones, uh, the foods, the, the, the lifestyle, the eating pattern, collaborate. You see doctors, nurses, dietitians, academia, students just really steeped in this world. So if you get a chance to go. Um, and then second, what was your second question? I forgot. I don't even remember now. My <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, is there a special organization just for registered dietitians that are vegan or plant-based? Yes, great question. There, it is called the Vegetarian Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group. So the acronym is VNDPG, and you can find it online. And they have a listing. Uh, I always recommend this. If you're looking for a dietitian in your community who is ve vegan or versed on vegan diets, that you can uh, look at their directory and find a dietitian. Of course, a lot of dietitians are doing um, Zoom uh, personal consults too. So even if they're not in your community, if you're okay doing a Zoom consult, you can find one there too. So, I, Do you think that dietitians still, some are, or some of the schools that teach it are still resistant to the evidence of the plant-based diet being so good for health in general and diabetes in particular? I think there's still some resistance, although this has changed, I would say, in the last seven or eight years with so much uh, information on plant-based diets coming out. I mean, you just can't ignore it anymore. It's just every study has, that's come out is a positive study, you know, and then in terms of the environment, you just can't ignore it anymore. So there, and then I think the fact that it's become so mainstream, that so many people are interested in eating a plant-based diet, that the dietitian world is kind of woken up a little and recognized, oh, this is valid. If my clients and patients want to do it, I should help them, you know? So there is a growing uh, awareness, but I wouldn't say it's a hundred percent. I would say there's still room. You're going to still find people in the medical world that are going to try to talk you out of it, e eating a vegan diet. It's not as common, but it will happen still. What is their what is their reason, Sharon? What, I mean, if it's been proven to be safe at every stage of life, even even infancy, even pregnancy, what is their resistance? Well, in the nutrition world, I think it's because there's this old philosophy of all food groups have to be part of a healthy diet. So, if you're eating a vegan diet, you're eliminating meat and you're eliminating dairy. The, when you look at the old food groups, but I like to to remind people, even the USDA in the meat group, they have soy and beans and peanut butter. So, I mean, we're, we're still not eliminating the traditional protein group. And even in the USDA recognizes soy milk as a dairy replacement. So to, technically you're not omitting any foods because even if you're going by the USDA guidelines, you're still eating foods from every food group. Um, and then we could even go further into the whole discussion about why, why there is a, you know, a requirement for dairy. You know, I mean, that's a huge controversy, why we even have dairy in, in our, you know, dietary guidelines, why it should be optional. Uh, there are a lot of people in the health organizations that are saying at least it should be optional because over half of the population in the planet can't even tolerate dairy. So there's a lot of controversy in the nutrition world over, over the power of some of these organizations getting into the USDA dietary guidelines. I mean, like this thing about like, you know, have you ever gone to a restaurant? I don't know, maybe a bowl restaurant, you know, where you can pick like a grain and, you know, maybe a bean and some vegetables. And, and then they say, well, do you want protein with that? As if like, if you don't get like fish or chicken or egg or cheese, you didn't have any protein. I know. <laughs> I know that annoys me so much. Uh, yeah, we're getting protein in all those foods and, and chickpeas have protein. Obviously there's, yeah, it's, it's really that idea that the only quality protein is going to be an animal protein that we have to, to really educate people about. Yeah. Let me check the chat. I go back and see if there's any questions. Here's one from Sue. What is your opinion on couscous? I would think unless somebody has to avoid gluten, there's nothing wrong with it. I love couscous. I use it all the time and it's a type of wheat. It's actually a pasta made from wheat. If you're gonna, uh, you could actually prioritize the whole wheat couscous. That's what I do if you can find that. But I love couscous. It's really delicious as a side dish. It, it's wonderful with tagine. Um, Moroccan dishes. 
So go for it. Well, in your book, which I'll hold up again, and there's, I've been posting the links all throughout the show. It's also in the show note, in addition to the chat, what information um, specifically can help readers that are trying to either avoid or reverse their diabetes? So I think if you, you know, the introduction of the book really has a lot of the nutrition information. It shares some of the latest nutrition science. I have quotes from experts like Neil Barnard and many others. Uh, who have been working in the diabetes space uh, in research world, working with clients. So it really kind of gives you that foundation of, of why a plant-based diet can be good for diabetes. And I think it's worthwhile just going through, through that beginning of the book. Also, I have little action tips uh, at the end of each chapter that, that there are little things that you can apply to your life to start getting your diabetes under control. For example, I recommend starting a journal if you haven't done that and start recording, especially when you change your diet you're doing, start recording like the numbers, you know, your, your ABCs of diabetes, your A1C, your blood cholesterol, um, and also your, your weight, waist circumference. Um, those are all blood pressure, all these things, start a diary and see how it's working for you. Um, and also if you, if you can, uh, start a diary for your diet and see how you're reacting to certain types of foods, your exercise plan, all of that's important. Um, and then have fun cooking recipes, you know, find some easy solutions on nights that you're too busy to, to try something new. There's a lot of great tips and everything about those easy solutions in the book as well. Yeah. Well, you know, let's just to play devil's advocate, let's say somebody's just challenging or doesn't think the plant-based diet is good for diabetes, then what diet are they recommending? I mean, if people go on a low carb or keto diet, are, are we seeing them get off their insulin doing that? For example, yeah, yeah, that's a really great point. And, um, you know, this, these low carb diets were gaining more traction for diabetes, but now, for example, some of this new research is comparing the healthy whole foods vegan diet with the traditional American diabetes association diet, which is, you know, just carb counting, you know, uh, keeping the carbs, you know, within this range and that that vegan diet did better. I mean, there is some research that's even showing you don't even need to worry about carbs, just eat vegan. Um, but I still feel like we need we need more research and each person has their own sort of kind of response to their diet. So I think getting your plan and giving yourself some time to see how your body's going to respond. I mean, if you're already eating this way, then you're used to it, but this is a whole new style of eating. Your body's going to take some time to respond to this new style of eating. Nice. Okay, so here is, I don't know what this is, Carlene. I didn't see the question, what Sharon thinks of personal fat threshold theory. I don't know what that is. Do you know what that is, Sharon? I haven't oh, heard that. that. I'm not sure I know what that is. Yeah, so maybe, please. I guess some people are just confused because most of the guests on this show and the doctors recommend, you know, no oil for yeah. diabetes or for diabetes, but you're not saying you have to have it. Yeah. I know it's, I do have very low amounts of fat, uh, added oil in some of my recipes, but it's always optional. Um, so if you can definitely do the no oil approach for sure, you will find no added sugars in my recipes and salt is always optional because I don't, I, you know, my preference is to not use any salt and, and to really let people get used to the natural flavor of food. Yeah. So that fits right in. Yeah. Oh, here's a question from Kay. She, she did join a little late and she wanted to know, is it for diabetics? Is it better to avoid all rice and pasta? So I recommend whole grains. So that brown rice would definitely fit into, to that lifestyle. Pasta actually, if you cook it al dente has a lower um, glycemic response. So it's one of those funny things. If you don't overcook your pasta, then it has a lower glycemic response. So I do have some pasta in my recipes. I, I would prefer a whole grain pasta if you can fit that in or even a pulse pasta, like a lentil or a chickpea pasta. So it's, it's completely doable. That would be when you're looking at planning your plate, if you're on insulin, that would be your whole grain or your grain, um, your one fourth of your plate. And then one fourth of your plate is the plant protein. And then that big half of it is the vegetables. Yep. Well, I don't have diabetes, thank God. And I don't think I'm gonna, but I always have to have my plate vegetables. I think that's good advice for anybody on any diet, don't you? Unless they're on the junk food diet, then they're not gonna have any vegetables. 
Exactly. We should all be eating this way. I mean, this is really the way all of us should eat. So that's what I always say. It's like, it's not really, this is the same way of eating. It's just a little bit more focused, you know, making sure your plate's a little more balanced, you know. I love it. Oh, let me ask you a question about the recipes in this wonderful book. Let me hold it up. Where did I just put it? It's just in front of me. Here we go. Uh, so what kind of recipes are available and what are some of your favorites? Yeah, you know, they're all some of my favorite recipes. It's really hard to pick. But for example, the chickpea tacos on the cover. I love these. It's a cauliflower chickpea tacos. We make these in our home all the time. Super easy to make. One of the things I try to do is make all the recipes approachable, easy. You're, you don't have to go and look for difficult ingredients. They should be things you can find in most uh, supermarkets. That's one of my favorite recipes. I also love the lentil meatballs on the back, and that is with pasta. So, um, And then this is like a, a chocolate chia pudding. So again, showing how you can have desserts. I also love um, the broccoli lentil soup, which is a very you know beautiful green soup, super easy. Uh, it's like a pureed soup. And then I, I have this poke watermelon bowl, which is fun. It's uh, using that. I don't know if you've tried to make a poke with watermelon, um, but watermelon, you can marinate it in like a ginger lime sauce. And it kind of has that look of poke. And then I've got my tofu that's also marinated. So I'm getting that protein. And then it's on a bowl with greens and, and uh, grains. So I do have a lot of bowl ideas. And I do really love bowls because here's another of the shawarma uh, cauliflower bowl because with the bowls you can really plan as I was saying that fourth plate thing if you think of your bowl you can have a fourth of it with the, the whole grain a fourth of it with your protein and then the rest all those beautiful vegetables so those are some ways you can really kind of help with your meal planning well, I think bowls are just the greatest and easiest way for everybody to eat. Some of these recipes look really good to me. The Thai green curry with eggplant and the yeah. broccoli leek soup looked great. And, you know, you have a section here of the safety of sugar substitutes. I'm curious I, how you feel about them, because I don't think they're healthy personally. I don't I don't really recommend sugar substitutes. I do have. Some of my, a couple of my dessert recipes, you'll see that I give uh, the option for monk free fruit or stevia, which I consider to be some of the safer ones. I don't personally use those. I would rather do what I'm doing here is having my bananas and not, not having any additional um, sugar substitute. Um, and research has shown that you can get used to the, the, the natural sweetness of foods. For example, you can get used to foods without all that sugar. And it's a gradual approach. So if something kind of tastes a little bit bland, you will get more and more used to not adding that extra sugar. So I, I do not recommend a lot of the artificial sweeteners, which is why I have that um, chart in the book to kind of give you some of the background on safety of those. All right. Thank you. You know, I just realized it's Father's Day and I forgot to wish if there's any viewers that are fathers, happy Father's Day. That's why the earlier show was with Dr. Columbus Batiste. If you didn't catch it, there's a replay. It's about erections, your heart and how it affects that. So thank you. And there is clarification for that question about the personal fat threshold theory, meaning that each person has a unique amount of body fat that can carry, but that once exceeded, once that is exceeded, insulin resistance can set in. Yeah. Um, I've not heard of it, ex ex you know, uh, titled that, but there is definitely uh, work that shows that when we have excess body fat and we are, we do have, have very specific genetic profiles and individual uh, body types. We know that for sure. So we know that in, in fact, certain uh, uh, groups like cultural groups, um, they have different parameters of body fat. Like for example, we're learning more and more about certain populations that when their body fat goes just a little bit higher, higher, they can get type two diabetes so much more quickly than other genetic profile groups. So we all have this unique amount of body fat that we can um, have within our bodies before we start having health issues, as you say, less uh, responsiveness to insulin. Um, so that is very unique. And I, I, I think we're gonna see more and more work going into those individual genetic pref uh, you know, preferences, styles, body types. Great. Do you work with people at all or individually anymore? Or? Uh, I do with, 
I have a colleague, another vegan dietitian colleague, and we do offer um, personal consultation. I have it on my page on my website. You can sign up on, on my shop page. You can sign up for a personal consultation with our team if you're ever interested. And she's uh, um, Allison Jordan is the, my colleague. She's a registered dietitian who's also a vegan dietitian. She's yes. really good diabetes as well. So yeah, maybe we should have her on the show sometime. I didn't. I wasn't. Aware of that, but I did. I did put your website in the show notes. Okay. Yeah. And yet you can sign up for my free newsletter and reach out to me if you have any questions on anything. That's great. Actually, you know, you remind me, okay, guys, we always play this game on the show. What actress or celebrity do you look like? And it's, it's, I just, I don't know who it is, but guys, help me out. It's somebody, who do people tell you? (laughs) I've had, I, I've had Jessica Lang when she was um, uh, uh, younger. I don't know. That's the one. That's what I've heard. And then some, some people that I don't even know, like some uh, from a movie, something about Honey, I Shrank the Kids, the actress from that. <laughs> some obscure, obscure connections. <laughs> I can see Jessica Lang a little bit. Guys, if you have a better suggestion, put it in the <laughs> show notes. Do you like people to follow you on Instagram or any other social media uh, links that I can give them? Yes. Uh, Instagram, I'm really active on at Sharon Palmer RD and also Facebook. Sharon Palmer, the plant power dietitian. I also am on Pinterest and Twitter at Sharon Palmer RD. Okay. If you want to give me those links, I did put Instagram in, but I'll go look for the Facebook link and find it. Well, anyway, congratulations on the book. That's so cool that they told you to write the book, the American Dietetic Association or Diabetes Pretty Association. Cool. Pretty cool. Thank you so much. It's been great. And happy Father's Day to everybody out there. That's great. Thank you, Sharon. Pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow. We have three shows at 11 a.m. Dr. Sunil Pai, Healing Spices. At 2 p.m., we have somebody awesome, Kathy Carmichael, making my very best potato salad. I wanted her to come on earlier so we could have made that for Father's Day. And at 5 p.m., my stand-up comedy show, the only way you get the link is if you're on my mailing list or write help at chefaj.com because Zoom does not allow us to post links on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube because we got in trouble for that last time. Take care.